we call this the Heisenberg equation of motion. So it's fulfilling the role of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, if we take uh, expectation values of both sides, uh, we can write that as follows. Well, we've sandwiched everything between um, time-independent Heisenberg states. Um, over here, uh, we, of course, just have the expectation value, where, again, there's no need to write the subscript H anywhere here because expectation values are independent of picture. And over here, we can bring the states within the time derivative because they're time-independent. Uh, but then we only have the expectation value of uh, a, sorry, a operator um, is written in Heisenberg picture, but again, expectation values are independent of picture, and so we have the result i h bar d expectation value of a by d t, where a is an arbitrary operator, is equal to the expectation value of the commutator of a with the Hamiltonian. Uh, and this is a very important result, it's what's called Aronofest's theorem. The reason it's so important is that it gives us a connection between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, which uh, from the very outset it was known that there should be such a connection. After all, we were starting off with classical systems and saying what happens when we look at these on the scale of individual particles. We'd like to think that if we put enough particles together we get the classical result back again. And Ehrenfest's theorem tells us that um, it's uh, the expectation values of quantum operators which really behave like classical objects. So in particular, we can take a couple of uh, very important examples. So the first example, let's take our operator A, uh, is given by the position operator. This is then a statement of Ehrenfest's theorem. We'll write the Hamiltonian, again, as the sum of the kinetic term and the potential term. But the potential term is always just a function of uh, the position operator, We're writing this all in terms of operators. And again, any function, to be really reading like this as some function of the position operator, where this is then defined by a Taylor series, say, of uh, this operator x. Uh, x will always commute with any function of x, and so this is going to disappear, and we're just left with the commutator of x with p squared uh, multiplied by 1 over 2m. Um, to evaluate this, we have the commutator of x and p, uh, and we use the result that for matrices A and B, a commutator B squared uh, is given by this, which you can derive fairly straightforwardly, and substituting it in and using our canonical commutation relation gives us this result. I h bar um, d by dt of the uh, expectation value of the position operator is equal to I h bar over m uh, multiplied by the expectation value of the position opera uh, momentum operator. We can cancel the I h bars to give the result dx by dt is p over m. But of course this is just the classical result, this just says that the velocity uh, is equal to the momentum divided by the mass. So what Ehrenfest's theorem is showing us is that um, the uh, on average, uh, where average is meant, we, we take the expectation value of the quantum operators, on average we get back the classical result. Let's take another look at another example. We take our operator A is equal to P. Uh, so the equation says, uh, whoops, that seems to put me into a different room. Uh, okay, never mind. So let's take the example that the operator A is equal to the momentum operator. In that case, what we need to evaluate is this, the commutator of the momentum with the Hamiltonian. We can expand the Hamiltonian just as before into the kinetic plus the potential part. The kinetic part will commute, p always commutes with p squared, and we need to evaluate the commutator of p with the potential. So the potential is defined uh, as a Taylor series. That is, it's just some function, but it's a function of the operator, uh, the position operator x. Uh, and we can think of any uh, such function of an operator as a Taylor series in terms of that operator. So in particular, we'd like to work out what the commutator of p is with any different power of the uh, position operator x. So let's work with that separately. So we have that uh, the commutator of our momentum operator with our position operator is minus i h bar multiplied by the identity operator. Um, it's uh, p comma x, so there's a minus sign here. 
Uh, and if we write this out, uh, we get the following expression. That is, uh, the P operator followed by the X operator is equal to the X operator followed by the P operator, but we have to subtract um, IH bar multiplied by the identity operator from it. So this gives us a useful trick of pulling through one operator through another. So P and X don't commute, so we can't say that PX is XP, but we can pull the P through the X at the expense of adding in this extra term. So for example, we can look at the commutator of P with X squared, which is PX squared minus X squared P. And we can take a look at this term here and realize that we have the following operator followed by the x operator, all followed by the x operator, and we can use our expression from the first equation uh, in parentheses here to rewrite, and we can expand this out to give this, where we've used the fact that the identity operator acting on any operator just gives that operator back, so the identity acting on the position operator gives the position operator. If we look at this expression, we can do the same trick again by noting that we have a px here again. We again expand it uh, and once again multiply out the parentheses. So we have x squared p minus ih bar x minus ih bar x. These two combine into one, giving us x squared p minus 2ih bar uh, x operator. And so overall, we find the result the commutator of p with x squared is minus 2ih bar times x. So um, we use this trick of pulling through the momentum operator through the position operator, um, giving us an extra term each time because they don't commute. Now you can do this uh, repeatedly for higher powers of x, and if you do it you find the following result. The commutator of p with x to the power n is equal to minus nih bar x to the n minus 1. So you see that what it's doing is very much like a derivative. We have this um, commutator of p with x to the n, lowering the power of x by 1 um, and bringing the n out the front. It's a lot like a derivative, but done purely in terms of the operator algebra. Next we need to write our potential v of x uh, out as a Taylor series, so let's do that over here. So uh, we can write our potential v of the operator x as a Taylor series, we've got some coefficients, um, a n. We'll take, separate out the n equals 0 term, so we get a 0 times the identity operator, and then sum from n equals 1 to infinity of coefficient a n divided by n factorial, multiplying x operator to the power n. So it's a usual Taylor series, but written in terms of operators. And this is what we mean when we say we have a function of an operator. And now what we can do is we can take the commutator of this thing with the momentum operator p. This is just to sum the Taylor series, so we're just going to take the uh, commutator of p with each term respectively. The commutator of uh, any operator with the identity operator is zero, um, and for each of the subsequent terms we just use our previous relation that we're going to drop a power of the uh, n from, uh, from the uh, power of x here down in front. Uh, pulling out the front the minus ih bar and uh, rewriting slightly we have uh, minus ih bar multiplying uh, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity a n over n minus 1 factorial multiplying x to the n minus 1. Um, this is just some other Taylor series describing a different function but we know what function it is and you can guess from the fact that um, the ends have just dropped a power here and the ends come out the front in fact, this is now a, a good Taylor series to describe it, the function we might naturally call v prime of x. That is, there's a function v of x, uh, and we've taken the derivative of that function, and then um, rather than just uh, have it as a function of a variable x, we've had it as a function of operator x. And so this is the function v prime, again, just defined by its Taylor series, um, and we're evaluating for the operator x. So the commutator with the momentum operator has brought out an i minus i h bar and taken the derivative of the function. So that's what we need in our expression over here. So we have that uh, cancelling the i h bars out. We get the result. Um, the change in the expectation value of the momentum operator with respect to time is equal to minus the expectation value of uh, v prime uh, evaluated uh, for the position operator x.
um, where V prime is the derivative of the potential. In three dimensions, uh, it would take the following form. So in three dimensions, it would be uh, the expectation value of the momentum operator, which is now a vector of operators. Uh, the change in that with respect to time is equal to minus the expectation value of the gradient of the potential um, function evaluated for the operator x. So this then looks very much like Newton's second law. Um, and it's tempting to say, and what it would be very nice to say in an ideal world, that while quantum mechanics and classical mechanics are different, uh, classical mechanics could be obeyed by the expectation values of quantum operators. That would be a nice, easy statement to make. But unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that. Because for that to be true, I'm going to emphasize that this is not true. So this does not equal uh, minus the gradient of V evaluated for the expectation value of x. So that's what you need. this is what you need to be true for Newton's second law to really be returned um, and, and the statement to be that expectation values of the operators obey classical mechanics. And this is not true because in general, the expectation value of the function of the operator is not the same as the function of the expectation value of the operator. The set of cases where that is true is fairly small, and we'll see some of those later in the course, in particular when you have a quadratic potential in, in position. So this is not the case, um, and we can't unfortunately make the statement that um, the expectation values of quantum operators obey classical equations. That's not quite true. Instead, uh, Ehrenfest's theorem is often cited as evidence in favour of the idea that um, of what's called the correspondence principle which says that classical mechanics should be returned in the limit of large quantum numbers. So this is something we'll see in a future video. Um, but there's, there's a, a way to look at this mathematically. Uh, if you go into some detail, you can sort of get some evidence for an idea as to how to get classical mechanics back from quantum mechanics. After all, you'd expect it to be a kind of smooth limit. Um, but it's not something we'll be taking a look at uh, just now in this course. All right. So let's see if I can get myself back to my usual room. So in the next video, we're going to take a look at uh, applying the Heisenberg equation of motion to look at conserved quantities. Thank you for your time.